Madam President, most people would be stumped by the question I'm about to ask, and that is, when it comes to the commission of crime, what is the largest in number congressional, or pardon me, criminal investigation in the history of the United States? The answer is January 6, 2021. Over 725 individuals have been charged with a federal crime as a result of that insurrectionist mob that descended on the Capitol. The reason I raise that is that we are going through regular, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly lectures from the Republicans about who's soft on crime and who really is on the side of the American people when it comes to defending our homes and our families. I listen to this debate on a regular basis as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Every single nominee that comes from the Biden White House is subject to being challenged as to whether they're going to defund the police or whether they're soft on crime. And yet, I have to say that it's hard to explain that the same Republicans asking these pointed questions to nominees are nowhere to be found when it comes to discussing January 6, 2021. In fact, many of them were cheerleaders and apologists for the very demonstrators who came into this United States Capitol. To think that a national political party like the Republican Party of the United States of America branded this insurrectionist mob and their attack on the Capitol as legitimate political discourse, that was the official statement, the unanimous statement of the Republican Party. Now, a few senators, Republican senators, have dissented, thank you. But why have it more? Why won't they step up and say a crime is a crime? And if over 700 people descended on this Capitol and are being charged with a crime, they should have to pay the price, whatever it happens to be. Because this just wasn't some idle political exercise. At the end of the day, we had six people dead as a result of that insurrectionist mob, including law enforcement officers. And 140 law enforcement officers attacked during the course of that day. We all saw the videos. There's plenty of them. Imagine, if you will, the so-called innocent, legitimate political discourse uh, travelers to Washington just happened to bring bear spray with them so they could spray police in the face with a poisonous a compound that could, in fact, harm them and did. Does that sound like a group of political tourists to you? It doesn't to me. These were violent individuals who were being called to task for having assaulted this Capitol, broken down the windows and the doors, came in here, aping along these uh, desks and chamber, forcing the Vice President of the United States and the senators who were there that day, and I was one of them, to exit by the back door for their lives. And here we have this we're not soft on crime message from Republicans who are making excuses. Not to mention the former President Donald Trump said, who said given the opportunity, he would pardon these demonstrators. No surprise in light of what he's done in the past. But uh, being lectured to regularly by the Republicans about who respects law enforcement and who's soft on crime most of them cannot answer the basic question of what they would do when it comes to the January 6 demonstrators, and the answer that they give is totally insufficient. And Madam President, you know personally, because you were here on the floor yesterday, that isn't all of it. I listened to all this talk about prosecutors doing their job, and I can't help but think what we went through yesterday on the floor of the United States Senate, when the junior senator from Arkansas, a Republican senator, stood here and vainly tried to defend what he is doing. You know what he's doing? You do personally. He is stopping the appointment of U.S. attorneys, federal prosecutors in state after state, and he's stopping the appointment of U.S. marshals who keep those courtrooms safe and the judges safe and transport prisoners and seek out fugitives. He is personally stopping them from being appointed in the ordinary course of business in the United States Senate. And you have to ask yourself, why? There must be a problem with their qualifications. No, there's not a single question being asked about the qualifications of these individuals. Mr. Frierson in the state of Nevada is a person that you and Senator Cortez Masto uh, described on the floor yesterday, uh, who would be the U.S. attorney there, and clearly is well qualified for that position. The same is true in Illinois. Our choice, Senator Duckworth and my choice, 
for the U.S. Marshal to serve in the Northern District of Illinois is an individual with 30 years, 30 years of law enforcement experience, a chief of police in one of the larger suburbs of the city of Chicago. Do we need a U.S. Marshal's office to be reinvigorated and, and dedicated to its purpose? Of course we do. It wasn't that many years ago when the family of one of our highly respected federal judges was literally murdered in their home by a deranged individual who didn't care for the way he was treated by that judge. It's a very real question of personal safety. And yet one Republican senator from Arkansas is stopping the appointment of these U.S. attorneys and U.S. Marshals to execute the laws of the land. Don't tell me you respect law enforcement, and don't tell me you want to fight crime, and then turn around and tie the hands of the Department of Justice, keeping U.S. attorneys off the job and U.S. Marshals away from their responsibilities. That is the reality. If we're going to get serious about fighting crime, and I believe we should, it's all hands on deck. Every federal law enforcement official should be doing their part. They cannot do their part when the junior senator from Arkansas stops us from even approving their appointments to these positions. These appointments remain vacant, and we pay a price for it. And when we receive lectures from the minority leader or from others on the floor about respect for law and law enforcement, I'd say he ought to start in his own caucus. He ought to call in the junior senator from Arkansas and say, enough. You're stepping on our message. We're trying to show that we're for law and order, and you are stopping the appointment of U.S. attorneys and U.S. marshals who are dedicated to that purpose and risk their lives to do so. That is not consistent with good law enforcement or sound law and order as far as I am concerned. And let me conclude by saying that the nominees that come before the Senate for these judicial positions are a wide variety of individuals with amazing backgrounds, incredible backgrounds, and consistently rated unanimously well qualified by the American Bar Association. It's true that some of them used to sit at the other table in the criminal courtrooms, not at the prosecutor's table. But there's nothing wrong with some balance on the court, making sure that we have all points of view considered and certainly above all, the law considered. Uh, we hear from time to time uh, compelling anecdotes, such as the one given by the minority leader uh, related to Louisville, Kentucky. I'm not familiar with the details. But if we are going to be serious about making America safer, we need to pull together on a bipartisan basis. We need to approve President Biden's budget, which provides more resources for law enforcement, but also more resources for violence intervention. You know personally, Mr. President, as a mayor of a large city in New Jersey, that it, it, we can't arrest our way out of the crime problem in America. Certainly, we should pursue law enforcement uh, measures and responses when necessary and apply the law without question. But it takes more than that. And if we're going to reach into the communities around America and try to stop this violence before it occurs, then we have to look at other approaches. I'm happy to report that last week we announced the introduction of the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, and this is a measure which for four years we've been trying to find common ground. We did it. We finally did it. I want to salute Senator Feinstein as the lead Democratic sponsor. I was happy to join her. And I also want to salute Senators Lisa Murkowski and Joni Ernst from Alaska and Iowa, respectively. They have done such extraordinary work putting together a bill. And you say to yourself, how does this fit in violence against women to the question of crime in America? Well, I can tell you, Mr. President, you know this personally, and it's worth repeating, that when I went to the juvenile facility in Cook County years ago, and said, who are these teenagers who came to the earth in the usual way and then turned to gangs and guns and killing wantonly? What happened to these kids along the way? Well, there are plenty of reasons and issues relating to mental health. But one of the things that was compelling was the observation that over 90% of them have been victims of trauma. And trauma comes in many forms, not just physical trauma, but to witness trauma on another person, to be a victim yourself, to have a, a home where there's no support, no encouragement, no values being taught. Those kids are the ones who end up many times in these predicaments. What can we do about it? Well, we can ultimately arrest them after a crime is committed, but that really doesn't solve the problem. We've got to do what we can to intervene in their lives at a stage where they can be saved. I don't believe that everyone can be saved, 
but I do fundamentally believe in redemption and our, our responsibility to engage in it. And that's why this Violence Against Women Act is so important. If we can reach into a home where physical or mental abuse has taken place, of a spouse or their children, and give that person, first a caring heart, someone who will listen and hear them out, and then advice on what to do to keep themselves safe, keep their kids safe, and what to do in relation to law enforcement. That is a positive move toward taking violence out of that family and out of America. So I hope that when we talk about this whole issue of safer America, which we all aspire to, that we do it in a balanced way. We talk about effective prosecution by members of law enforcement who are playing by the rules, but we also realize that it takes more than that. We need an investment in the communities to make a difference. President Biden knows that. He included it in this year's budget. Will, he will again in next year's budget. We ought to be standing up and supporting that as well.